Let's take our Bibles this morning, go to the book of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2. I was asking the Lord during that last song, Lord, what are you speaking to me? What are you saying? And he said to me, I want you to pray over Harry, the little boy that was right next to me, pray for an anointing on his life, for you to touch his life and to raise him up to do great things. That's what I sensed. I didn't want to say it with him here. God is touching lives. He wants to touch all of our lives. Doesn't matter if, I'm not sure how old Harry is. Um, Doesn't matter if you're 10, I don't know, or you're 100. He still wants to touch our lives. Fresh ways. Exciting ways. Anointed ways. Hey, I'm standing behind a tool chest here. It's kind of crazy. First time I've been in this pulpit, actually. We are in our fourth week together, and we have heard God's word through a video. That was the introduction, and then James came behind that and opened up a great message on remorse. And then last week was incredible, wasn't it? It was just a little bit unusual how everything came apart at the seams, and then God put it all back together again, and we still heard the word of God preached. I want to talk a little bit about, in my introduction, about deconstruction or deconstructing. It's a very, very well-known word being used. It's a belief that is being embraced not only by politicians and culture, but by Christians. I want to show you some images. I'm bringing these back. I did that um, during the introduction. So you might recall me making reference to Josh Harris. Joshua Harris, he was a pastor of a very well-known church, wrote a book that I used when I was a youth pastor, Kissing, Dating, Goodbye, and, and uh, this is maybe 25, 30 years ago, maybe even about 30 years ago, and he has deconstructed his faith. In other words, he has rejected the gospel. He's rejected Jesus Christ as his Savior, and that, to me, was disturbing. It's happening on, on a much larger scale. Lower left um, was the lead singer of a, a Christian band that I would listen to called Caveman's Call. And the lead singer, I can't remember his name, but he goes by a different, much different name now, Flamey Grant. And he has deconstructed his faith. In other words, he's apostatized, he's rejected it. The once true gospel that he held to so tightly, now he rejects. Deconstruction. And then on the right there is a book that came out. I would not recommend this book unless God told you to read it. And you need to be super, super discerning. This is a man who had a very influential church, Tim, and he now has deconstructed his own faith and rejected the gospel. This is going on in our culture. It's going on in the Christian church it's very disturbing to me. Uh, these are people that I had looked up to, I listened to, I had enjoyed music, uh, I had embraced as an example maybe for a while, and then all of a sudden, years and years later, I'm like, what has happened? What is going on here? And so I went before the Lord as we moved past Christmas, and I said, Lord, what do you want us to do? And I really sensed in my heart he wanted us to counter what might be going on in our culture of deconstructing Instead of deconstructing, we will reconstruct. And there's a book in the Bible that is all about that. It's the book of Nehemiah. I hope that you've turned there. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 9 down to verse 20 is what we're going to look at this morning. I titled this, The Reexamination. The Reexamination. Now, we've done uh, many, many thoughts, many verses we've looked at in the three weeks previous. We looked at the remnant. We looked at the report that Nehemiah had received. We looked at how he was remorseful over the sins of his people and the condition of the wall in Jerusalem. We looked at the request that he made to King Artaxerxes and also the resources that he received for the reconstruction of the walls of Jerusalem. 
I want to look at the re-examination. Now, who likes an exam, right? And so I have a couple of examples here of what an examination would be. On the left there would be more of an academic examination. And I don't know about you, but I never looked forward to those. In fact, I'm taking a couple of college courses now, and there's quizzes and exams, and I, I'm just not a big fan of that. I'll do the best that I can. But what the professor wants to do is examine the knowledge that I'm trying to absorb, and then I'm going to be tested for that. On the right there is more of a physical exam, and I, I just don't like when people are poking and prodding all over me. I don't know about you, but they're trying to see how I'm doing physically. There's an examination the Bible talks about examination, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. You'll see it on the screen here. Paul said this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. It's important. It's important that you look at yourself and go, am I really a Christian? This is what he's saying to the Corinthian church. There are reasons why he had to write this. Do you not realize this about yourselves? You've got to test yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you'll find out that we have not failed the test. In other words, I'm a sincere believer. This is what he's saying. His credibility was being called into question by false apostles and false teachers going up against Paul, and the Corinthians were then going towards them, not towards the one who had given birth to them spiritually, planted the church. Now he's writing back to them and saying, listen, you got to examine yourself to see if you're really a Christian because the way that you're living your life is contrary to the gospel. It's a very strong word. But it's an important word, not just for them, but for us today, for Christians today, at least those who profess Christianity. He goes on to say at the bottom there, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. In other words, I want you to look at my life. You can examine my life, he says, and you will find that I have passed the test. But now I'm going to encourage you as your spiritual father. I want you to examine yourself to see if you're really in the faith. So important for today. We're going to look at a re-examination of the walls in Jerusalem. And this is what Nehemiah does in our text. Now here's what I want to do. I'm going to read this, and I'm going to read this rather quickly. So if you could follow along. Verse 9 of chapter 2. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river. You'll notice that's capitalized. And gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, servant heard this, it, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was an, no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring, to the dung gate, and I expected the wall, inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up into the night, in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Senballat, Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, servant, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will rise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Let's look at this together. As I looked at the text this past week, prayed over it and asked the Lord, what are the truths that are found therein that I could share with York Street? I found four of them. I want you to write these in. When you engage in a re-examination, you will have to expect, number one, opposition. Expect opposition. It's in verses 9 and 10. Nehemiah's journey back to Jerusalem was a massive undertaking. It all began with the report. We know that. And it brought him to remorse. We saw that. And brokenness. He said that I sat down and wept and mourned for days. This is in verse 4. 
Notice he said that I sat down. It was so overwhelming, the report of the walls being broken down, that he couldn't stand to his feet. He was so overcome by this news of his people, his homeland, and the walls being destroyed that he had to sit down. And it says there that he wept and he mourned for days. Almost four months have passed. And that's when he gave the request to King Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes is the one who noticed his countenance, and we saw this last Sunday. Why is your face sad, he said. Chapter 2, verse 2, are you sick? This is Artaxerxes now looking at Nehemiah. Nehemiah couldn't hold it in any longer. All of that praying, all of that crying, all of the weight and the burden of the walls being destroyed and all of the things that he lifted up before the Lord. Lord, what do you want? How am I to be a part of what you want to do in rebuilding and reconstructing the walls of Jerusalem? Well, Artaxerxes notices that. His response, Nehemiah's response was a request. And can I return to the land of my father's graves, which lie in ruins, he said. So he asks for the resources. They're provided as needed, even a passport of protection, letters they're called, to get through a hostile territory to get to Jerusalem. So verses 9 to 20 is Nehemiah returning to re-examine the walls. What he first faces is opposition. He makes it safely, the text says, then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river. That's like saying on the other side of the tracks. When it's capitalized, this is actually a territory you didn't really want to go through because it would be dangerous. Beyond the river. And gave them the king's letters. The Bible says, and we've read it, he had been given an escort. That's the rest of verse 9. Verse 10, but when. Notice that. It's a very important transitional thought there. But when. You could almost hear the background noise. You ever watched a movie and all of a sudden it's going to change and it gets really dramatic and it gets really dangerous and the music starts to change and you're like, something's coming. That's the but when. Here come the opposers against Nehemiah and against the mission of God, the purposes of God. Listen, when God advances forward, satanic attack is inevitable. You try to bring reconstruction to your own life. You try to go, God, I just want to be a better Christian. I want to be a stronger Christian, a more faithful Christian. And then all of a sudden, you're going to face satanic attack. I've had people being baptized, and I said to them before they got in the waters of baptism, I just want you to know that your life's going to get harder from here on out. Just being truthful with them. If you want to reconstruct your family that has been hit by the devil and your kids aren't following Jesus, you want to step into that, then expect opposition. This is the way it goes. Here they are. They're enemies of God. They're Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite. I want to focus in on Sam Ballot because he seems like he's the ringleader here. He's mentioned first. His name means sin has given life. Sin has given life. He's from Samaria. Reference that in your mind. That's important in a moment. Northwest of Jerusalem. Tobiah the Ammonite, he's a longtime enemy of God's people. He's northeast of Jerusalem. And they both were longstanding opposers of God's purposes. Now, typically, opposition will come from those that are closest to you. This is why it's so hurtful. This is why the psalmist said it was my friend who came against me. That was the biggest pain that David ever went through. It was his own closest friends and family that became his opposers. Very difficult when those closest to you turn on you and betray you. God's good hand was on Nehemiah's life, and Sanballat and Tobiah somehow knew this. Nehemiah had favor. We looked at that last, Lord's. They had favor with King Artaxerxes. And when you get favor with God, watch the person that's closest to you then will turn on you because they're jealous and envious that you have the favor of God, and they think they don't. It's going to leave your head reeling. You're going to be like, I don't get this. I thought we loved each other. I thought they were close. I thought that we had built a relationship. And then they betray you. I want to go a little bit further into the text here and and try to look at this first point. The Bible says it displeased them. This is Sanballat and Tobiah. It displeased them. 
greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. All right, so if I go Greek on you, what's that called? Anybody know? It's Chobani time. Just trying to keep it light. Just trying to keep it light, that's all. If we go into the New Testament, it's written in Greek, and that's why I, I say that. But if we go into the Old Testament, then, then what's it written in? It's written in Hebrew, and it's matzo ball time, right? Did you guys pick up on this when you sat down and we're looking up here? Okay. Let's go a little matzo ball. Katza, katza. That's the Hebrew word for displeased. It means furious. It means they fretted, Sanballat, Tobiah. It means they were angry. They were uh, condemnatory. Think about Sanballat and Tobiah with me. Uh, there's another word that would describe this, wrath. We don't use wrath, W-R-O-T-H. That would be an old word. Maybe a more modern word would be wrath. And so this is, this is uh, Sanballat and Tobiah. They're displeased with Nehemiah. Now, here's where I'm going to try to do something here, and I just want you to go with me, okay? Uh, don't call me a wingnut. You can send me an email if you want and, and respond that way, but don't do it now. If you look at this, you go, he's just way out there. We've lost him. He's gone. Pray for him. So go with me. First Kings, you'll see it on the screen. I'm going to go back into this text with you. It's the same Hebrew word. It's the same meaning, but there's a story here I want you to see. And we're going to see what's behind the opposers. We're going to see about those people that come against you. You're living righteous. You're trying to be faithful. You love Jesus. You're trying to reconstruct your own life. You're trying to reconstruct your family's life, your friend's, fam your friend's life that's been hurt. I want you to think like Jesus. Jesus looked at Peter and said what? Get, be, get thee behind me. Who? Satan. He's talking to Peter. He's in his face, but he's looking at Satan. Behind Peter. You're opposers. It's not about flesh and blood. You don't battle against flesh and blood, the Bible says in Ephesians 6. You battle against principalities, powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this age. You got to think like Jesus here. I'm going to show you where the origins of the opposers come from. Here we go. 1 Kings 20, 43, And the king of Israel went to his house, vexed and sullen, and came to Samaria. Who's the king? Anybody know? It's Ahab. This is the story about Ahab and Jezebel. So Ahab's the king. He's vexed and he's sullen. This is displeased, same word. He's upset. He goes on in chapter 21 of 1 Kings. Now Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the place of Ahab, king of where? Where was Sanballat from? Samaria. I mean, there's a connection here. But again, we're going behind something to try to look at it. And after this, Ahab said to Naboth, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near my house and I will give you a better vineyard for it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value and money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. What did Ahab do? And he went into his house vexed and sullen. He's displeased. Quatsaf, furious. Wrath, condemnatory. He's threatened. How dare you, Naboth, say to me, no to my request. And what does Ahab do? Do you know the rest of the story? He goes to his wife, and his wife Jezebel does what? Slanders Naboth, and Naboth is killed. So who's behind Ahab, and who's behind Jezebel? Who would you say? Satan. Satan. Sam Bath from Samaria was oppressed. I would even say that Ahab was possessed. I certainly know that Jezebel was possessed. Now, before you go to those who are opposing you for anything, I do not recommend that you say that they are possessed. You're going to need massive amounts of discernment. 
and you want to pull back and be very care, careful and cautious. But you have to think through this. Uh, who, who is it that is opposing you, and why are they opposing you? For Sanballat and Tobiah, it was coming out of this threat inside of them. They saw Nehemiah, who had favor with King Artaxerxes, and that bothered them inside. So when people come near you and you're trying to do what God has called you to do, to walk with Jesus, and I'm telling you, if you say to some of your friends or your family members that you want more of Jesus and you want to walk more with Jesus, you might have them come against you. They will mock you, make fun of you, say it's never going to happen. You've always been that person. You're never going to change. Let me just say to you, who is behind that? The devil the devil is behind that. Expect opposition, number one. Number two, examine openly. This is verse 11 down to verse 16. Nehemiah said, so I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. He probably needed the three days to rest. He's tired. It was a long journey. So he takes the three days to rest and, and just gather himself and what he does next is very wise, the re-examination of the walls. It's in the night. He goes at nighttime. Why does he do that? He wants to make sure that any enemy would not know what he's doing. He also wants his own people, really, not to know what he's doing. You see, he's gotten the vision of God, and he's going to take the vision of God, then give it to the people. The people of God then help carry the vision. Vision comes typically through a man, through a leader, through a person, and then it is spread to others, and others grab a hold of that, and then you execute it. That's what's happening here. He goes into the night. We've already read it. Uh, he's traveling from north to south around the different gates to see the condition. He's examining it. But I, I put that word openly because he needed an honest evaluation of what the walls look like. How bad was the devastation? It might have looked something like this. This isn't like the Jerusalem wall, but I found a picture that might have represented what he saw as he's examining the walls, broken down. And now here's what I want you to do, because this is what a preacher has to do. Take the Bible, make sure it's in context, make sure the interpretation's right, then bridge it all the way to modern times where we live, and how do we apply this? So some of the comments I'm going to make all the way up to the end are applicational. So think about your own life. The walls have been destroyed. The enemy has gotten in, somehow gotten into your life, and now you're, you're, you're like, how do I reconstruct my life? Well, you have to re-examine things first. You're going to have to ask the questions. What happened to my life? How is it that that hole got there, that crack got there? How is it that the enemy was able to come in? Did it, you have to re-examine openly. Examine openly. Be honest with yourself. How did the devastation happen? The wreckage is bad here in Jerusalem as Nehemiah takes a look at it during the night with just a few others. What was he thinking as he's looking at all of this? Was he overwhelmed? Was he discouraged? Was he intimidated? Was he fearful? I don't think he was. I don't. I think he realized that God had sent him on mission, that he had the anointing of God. God had spoken to him. He had spent a lot of time weeping before the Lord, hearing the Lord's voice. I think he was in a good place spiritually. I think when he looked at the walls, he's like, all right, okay, it's pretty bad out here but that's not going to stop us from rebuilding. Examine openly. Be honest. Be truthful. Don't deny. Oh, don't deny and don't run. You've got to look at yourself in some ways. You've got to go, well, okay, what sin is sabotaging my life? What is it that has taken a grip on your soul for so long or maybe in your family for so long? You're going to have to openly look at that and say, yeah, I mean, that's, that's it. Now, I did that this past week. I'm telling you, it's not easy to do that. It's hard. I get it. I totally understand. What about your family? Why are your children rejecting the gospel? And you raised them, maybe in this church. You've got to look at that and you go, what happened to my son? What happened to my daughter? They were here at one time. Now, they don't care about Jesus anymore. They've deconstructed their faith. What happened? And if you decide to help reconstruct their faith, it starts with you. It always starts with the leader. 
My family isn't spiritual. It's not strong. Why is that? Can I encourage you? I want you to say this in your heart. Lord, what did I do or did not do that I should have done? I've encouraged specifically men through the years that if you weren't the spiritual leader in your home, you go right to your kids. And no matter if they're 40, 50 years old, you go to them. I say, I'm just sorry. I'm sorry. I should have been a spiritual leader to you. I should have prayed with you maybe. I, I should have talked more about Jesus. I should have lived it a lot more consistently than I ever did. I, I just want to say to you that Jesus is doing a fresh work in me, and I just want you to know that I love you. I've always loved you. I just wasn't in a good place. Examine openly. When you decide to do that, what's going to happen to you? Opposition. The devil's going to come after you. Demons are going to come after you. Your flesh is going to come after you. That's what's going to happen. So get ready. But on the other side of that, on the other side of the walls being built again by Nehemiah and his team, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Every church needs to go through this. Every church that I've been called to, this is my approach. I first examine openly my own life. I did this when I was coming here. Lord, am I ready? What's my character like? Am I trusting you enough? I ask the, the tough questions of myself first. You don't start with somebody else. You start with you. And I did that for weeks and weeks, praying that out, even before I met you. Examine openly. And then what I did is I examined the condition of the church. This is what Nehemiah did with the walls. Here's number three. Exhort oneness, I call it. It's in verse 17 and 18. Exhort oneness. These were to do the work. It's what it says there. These were to do the work. At the end of verse 16, the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest. I love that, and the rest. Notice that. All were to have a part in the reconstruction. And then Nehemiah says, then I said to them. Here comes the vision speech. Nehemiah is passionate. He's prayed up. He's examined himself. He's discerned everything he needs to discern that needs to be done. Now he speaks to all of these people that are gathered there. You've got to remember something. This is a, a crowd that is very demoralized. They're hurt. They're, they're despondent. Uh, they don't have motivation. Uh, they've been many, many, many decades, over 100 years in this condition. So you're talking about generation upon generation. And you're going to try to turn all of that around? That's a big, big reconstruction project. And so this is what Nehemiah does. Uh, he's speaking into a hopeless situation, hopelessness, hope deferred. They felt humiliation. They felt the defense Listness of not having a wall. And the shame of it is when it, when it says there in the text that they were feeling defiled. We got to remember that they disobeyed the Lord and that brought judgment. Do you know what can happen to us if we disobey the Lord? Then God can discipline us and he'll use Persia. He'll use Babylon, Babylonians. And so that, that caused them to walk in shame. And so Nehemiah is trying to bring hope to them. You don't have to walk in that anymore. It's a wonderful message. But it's a vision message he's giving right here. And he starts to, to speak it and, and to preach it. Listen, you got to have a God-sized vision. I remember uh, going to a conference many, many years ago, and if the vision is too small, it's not of God, is what the person said. In other words, if your vision is too small, then you don't need to trust God. You can just do it yourself. So make sure that you position and posture yourself in a place that it's going to be impossible for you to do it in your own strength. you got to rely on God. So make the vision as big, big, so that you're dependent and low before him and trusting him. This is a big vision that Nehemiah is giving the people here. 
He wants to take them vertical is what I say a lot here. You don't want to stay horizontal. You want to go vertical, and that's what he does. A God-centered focus. Now remember, it's, it's God's favor. This is what is more than anything. God's good hand is on my life. Really what he's saying is God's hands on this project, this reconstruction project. He gives a great, great vision message. I remember going to our church in Pennsylvania, and, and when we got there, uh, there was a couple that was in leadership, and the, we had lunch together or dinner together, and they said, what's your vision for the church? And um, the wife was taking leadership at Lancaster Bible College. She had a degree in leadership, and so I thought that was awesome. Uh, but she kind of pressed in on me a little bit, and she says, so what's the vision, what's the vision, what's the vision? And, and I was like, I kind of just processed that a little bit, and husband didn't say anything. It was only the wife that was asking this for some reason. And uh, I said, get God to come back to church. That's the vision. That's all I said. That's all that God gave me. Just get God to come back. It wasn't good enough for her. And so they left. And I was like, okay. Do you know what happened? God came back to church. And she missed it. She missed it. If you want anything in your life, does this church want, if you want anything as a church, God's favor. That's what you want. You want the anointing. That's the greatest vision. I've read a lot of books on vision. When God comes to York Street and he's like, I am pleased with this place. I am happy to be here. My manifest presence is here, changing lives and saving people, healing people. That's the vision. Get God. And this is what he's saying here. Let us build, he says. Let us build, he exhorts. It's a great word. It means to emphatically urge someone to insist or beseech, admonish, appeal. I appeal. I remember an older man. He was about 85 years old. He was part of the original core group in Pennsylvania. And he said to me when we first got there, I don't think God could do this. I don't think God's going to turn this around. I said, no, no, no. God will come back. He'll come back. He'll do something powerful here. He will do it. Probably about a year later, he's standing in the lobby. He's about, I think he was 82 at the time. And he's just looking and he's staring off. I was like, what's going on? Are you okay? We're about ready to go into church. And he's just there looking at all the people. And he's like, I didn't think this could happen. I didn't believe this. Urge your family. Urge them. Exhort them. Beseech them. Here's some verses here. I just go fly through these really quickly, and then I'll go to number four. Acts 2.40. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. That's Peter's message out of Pentecost. I just took a little bit of that, and I just want you to see that this exhortation, he's bearing, he's bearing witness and exhorting them. It's a very strong exhortation. Exhortations typically are stronger. Beseech. I entreat you. Uh, very strong words. Admonish. 1 Thessalonians 2.12, it says there, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged. See, the exhortation part is really direct, really prophetic. I'm in your face. I'm in your space. I, I want you to, to live for Christ. You know, I love you. you. You need to repent. Please don't go further away from Jesus than you already are. That's exhortation. Then the encouragement, there's the other side of that. That's more of the tender, compassionate you were charged to walk in a manner worthy of God who called you into his own kingdom and glory. And then Peter says this. Next slide, please. So I exhort. There's that word again. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you exercising oversight. And again, another exhortation, emphatic, beseech you. Peter says it. Colossians 3.16, that was written by Peter or Paul. You'll see it on the screen there. Same thing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, ritually teaching and admonishing. There's our word. 
one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Exhort, exhort to oneness. You see the trouble that we're in. This is what he says here. I'm back in Nehemiah. He reminds them honestly that it is troubling, not just trouble, but troubling. There's this urgency that Nehemiah is speaking here in his vision, message. You know that Nehemiah could have gone back to Persia, right? He could have gone back and just said, you know what? I'm just going back to privilege in a position that I'm very comfortable in. But Nehemiah puts himself into that situation. He's talking in the first person there that we may no longer suffer derision. That we may no longer. This is wonderful about Nehemiah. This is what leaders do. Leaders get in the middle of it all. Leaders don't say to their people, you go over there and, and, and I hope it all works out for you. They get in the middle of it and they say, we're going to do this. This is what we're going to do. We're going to rebuild this wall. The time is now. He references God's favor again in the text. I told them, this is Nehemiah, I told them of the hand of my God that had been on me for good. It's not pride, it's confidence, it's assurance. Listen, men, you've got to be that confident that God has called you to be the spiritual leader. You've got to believe that God's hand is on you. And if you haven't been the spiritual leader, then, then ask for the anointing of God. Ask him to do something inside of your heart, fresh and new. Your kids might be grown up. It might be grandkids now. I don't know. You got to believe. You got to know. You got to be sure that God's hand is on you. And his hand is on you. I know that it is. I know that it is. You just got to believe that about yourself. This is important for him to say to them. They needed to have confidence in their leader that the walls could be rebuilt. The words of, I love this, the words of the king that I had spoken, the king had spoken to me, pardon me, Artaxerxes, he's referencing what Artaxerxes had said. He's a world ruler. He's probably the most powerful person in the land. Probably in history, right at that moment in history, the most, and even he references King Artaxerxes' favor on him. He's ready. What was their response? Let us rise up and build. Isn't that good? Man, you give out a vision that's from God and the spirit of God is on that. You'll have a reaction. Wouldn't it be great if your family that has been hurt spiritually, all of a sudden, yes, dad, yes, mom, let's rebuild this thing. Oneness and unity. Where did I get that? It's that little phrase, two words, so they. There it is. So they. Oneness is important. Everybody has to be unified. This is vital. It's vital. All right, husband, if you you're want to reconstruct your family spiritually, what if your wife isn't in on that? How about mom? You want to reconstruct your family or your son, try to help him come back to the Lord. And your own husband isn't unified. There's not oneness there. That's going to be an issue. You got to be together on this thing. Nehemiah knows that. Everyone together, unified, active, participating, loving, giving, serving. The majority were on board. The majority of them. But know this, not everybody will come with you. Not everybody will come. John chapter 6, don't turn there, 60 to 71, if you want to write it, and then footnotes there, John 6, 60 to 71, not everybody went with Christ. He said, I want you to drink my blood and eat my flesh. That's what he said there. The Bible says that that was too hard for them to receive, and his disciples left him. Left him. Many of them did. Paul had this happen. You'll see him on the screen. 2 Timothy uh, chapter, I think it's 4, 10, and 16. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me, and he's gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. And at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. Reconstruction. Sometimes those people that you thought would be the closest would go with you the longest won't be there. It's all part of it all. It's all part of it all. 
I remember a woman down in uh, Harvest in Pennsylvania, and she was, she didn't go with us. Another one didn't go with us. That's okay. I mean, if God had them go somewhere else, it's fine. But during my preaching, she would drop F-bombs. And she'd be on the floor rolling around. She'd talk about me when I'm preaching. I could hear her. You could hear her. And so I approached her with my wife, and I said, you know that I love you, and you know that we do, and I want to be your pastor, but you cannot. You cannot do this anymore. All of a sudden, she just erupted in anger and just ran out of the building. Never saw her again. Lisa and I were like, oh, great. This is, we're trying to build a church here, and people are leaving left and right. The next week, 30 people showed up. Not everybody's going to go with you. And you could try to reconstruct all you want. I just want you to know that. I don't want you to get discouraged. Number four, encourage overcoming. This sounds a little bit confusing. I hope I, hope I can communicate this as we close. Encourage overcoming. Verse 19 and 20. Here comes Sanballat and Tobiah again. Notice that. They come back around, but they bring somebody else, Geshem, the Arab. Isn't that interesting? Now they got three, and Geshem is from the south of Jerusalem, so it's almost like they're surrounded. Northeast, northwest, south. Nehemiah has all these opposers that are around. We'll see this in chapter 4, the opposition more and all of that. Well, here's... Here's Sanballat, I think he's the ringleader, and he's getting a group now. He's trying to get an, an army behind him, and this is what happens. Reminds me of the story of Charles Stanley. You're familiar with him. Charles Stanley was becoming or wanted to hear the word of the Lord about First Baptist in Atlanta, and so he went there, and as he was going through the process, he had this group of seven men and seven families, really, that opposed him. Very similar to Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem. And there was this mounting thing that was coming against him. And if you watch the documentary, if you're interested, I can send it to you. I watched it not long ago and really spoke to me about Charles Stanley. I didn't know too much about his ministry. I truly love this man in a different way after watching him walk through that. And so what ended up happening is that Charles Stanley decided that uh, he, would, he would stay silent and um, just trust the Lord with that. It split the church. About 3,000 people left, and they had to reconstruct First Baptist of Atlanta. But it was interesting because Charles Stanley's ministry then went worldwide as a result of all of that hardship. The reason why I say that, because there, there's a text here that he no doubt experienced, it says about Sanballat, Tobiah, and Nagishim, they jeered at us and despised us. What is this that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? What's that phrase? That phrase is slander. That's what that is. That's not accurate. He knows the king. What are you saying, Sanballat? So when this happens to him, he has to overcome or he has to encourage overcoming to the people that he's speaking to, that are going to become part of his team. So he replies, this is Nehemiah verse 20. I replied to them, others are, and here's, here's what's happening. You got this moment, vision meeting, it's awesome. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem now make it awkward. He says, the God of heaven, Nehemiah, the God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will rise and build. That's powerful. It's so powerful. He knows that those who are listening to Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem need to be encouraged to overcome. He says to them, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Sometimes you just have to say it the way it is. This is what Nehemiah does. This is who he is as a leader. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem come back in chapter 4.
But Nehemiah and his team finished the wall in 52 days. Amazing. Amazing. Listen, I'm going to close. No enemy formed against you will prosper. The enemy wants to come against you, try to stop the reconstruct of your own soul, your own family, your son or your daughter, your grandson or daughter. No weapon formed against you will prosper. God will make sure of that. You stay faithful like Nehemiah did. You do what you need to do that God has called you to do, to reconstruct. He'll be with you. He'll strengthen you. He'll give you that anointing that you need. And you'll see that your family will come back again. Your child will come back again. Your grandchild will live for Christ. But you got to be as bold as Nehemiah. you got to go after it like he did. Do not give up. I want you to be encouraged. But you have to re-examine some things. What do you have to re-examine this morning? How honest do you have to be? Let's go to the table of the Lord. James, come up here and lead us to the table, and maybe we could use that for a time of re-examination.